Introduction and Part 1 of Chapter 1 of The Brotherhood of the Seven Kings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Brotherhood of the Seven Kings by L. T. Mead and Robert Eustace. Introduction. That a secret society, based upon the lines of similar institutions so notorious on the continent during the last century, could ever have existed in the London of our day may seem impossible. Such a society, however, not only did exist, but through the instrumentality of a woman of unparalleled capacity and genius, obtained a firm footing. A century ago the Brotherhood of the Seven Kings was a name hardly whispered without horror and fear in Italy, and now, by the fascinations and influence of one woman, it began to accomplish fresh deeds of unparalleled daring and subtlety in London. By the wide extent of its scientific resources, and the impregnable secrecy of its organizations, it threatened to become a formidable menace to society, as well as a source of serious anxiety to the authorities of the law. It is to the courtesy of Mr. Norman Head that we are indebted for the subject matter of the following hitherto unpublished revelations. CHAPTER One: AT THE EDGE OF THE CRATER TOLD BY NORMAN HEAD it was in the year 1894 that the first of the remarkable events which I am about to give to the world occurred. They found me something of a philosopher and a recluse, having, as I thought, lived my life and done with the active part of existence. It is true that I was young, not more than thirty-five years of age, but in the ghastly past I had committed a supreme error, and because of that paralyzing experience I had left the bustling world and found my solace in the scientist's laboratory and the philosopher's study. Ten years before these stories begin, when in Naples studying biology, I fell a victim to the wiles and fascinations of a beautiful Italian, a scientist of no mean attainments herself, with beauty beyond that of ordinary mortals. She had appealed not only to my head, but also to my heart. Dazzled by her beauty and intellect, she led me where she would. Her aims and ambitions, which in the false glamour she threw over them I thought the loftiest in the world, became also mine she introduced me to the men of her set. I was quickly in the toils, and on a night never to be forgotten, I took part in a grotesque and horrible ceremony, and became a member of her brotherhood. It was called the Brotherhood of the Seven Kings, and dated its origin from one of the secret societies of the Middle Ages. In my first enthusiasm it seemed to me to embrace all the principles of true liberty. Catherine was its chief and queen. Almost immediately after my initiation, however, I made an appalling discovery. Suspicion pointed to the beautiful Italian as the instigator, if not the author, of a most terrible crime. None of the details could be brought home to her, but there was little doubt that she was its moving spring. Loving her passionately as I then did, I tried to close my intellect against the all-too-conclusive evidence of her guilt. For a time I succeeded, but when I was ordered myself to take part in a transaction both dishonorable and treacherous, my eyes were opened. Horror seized me, and I fled to England to place myself under the protection of its laws. Ten years went by, and the past was beginning to fade. It was destined to be recalled to me with startling vividness. When a young man at Cambridge I had studied physiology, but never qualified myself as a doctor, having independent means. But in my laboratory in the vicinity of Regent's Park I worked at biology and physiology for the pure love of these absorbing sciences. I was busily engaged on the afternoon of the 3rd of August, 1894, when Mrs. Kenyon, an old friend, called to see me. She was shown into my study, and I went to her there. Mrs. Kenyon was a widow, but her son, a lad of about twelve years of age, had, owing to an unexpected death of a relative, just come in for a large fortune and a title. She took the seat I offered her. "'It is too bad of you, Norman,' she said. "'It is months since you have been near me. Do you intend to forget your old friends?' "'I hope you will forgive me,' I answered. "'You know how busy I always am.' "'You work too hard,' she replied. "'Why a man with your brains and opportunities for enjoying life wishes to shut himself up in the way you do, I cannot imagine.' "'I am quite happy as I am, Mrs. Kenyon,' I replied. "'Why, therefore, should I change?' "'By the way, how is Cecil?' "'I have come here to speak about him. You know, of course, the wonderful change in his fortunes?' "'Yes,' I answered.' He has succeeded to the Carn property, and is now Lord Carn. There is a large rent-roll and considerable estates. You know, Norman, that Cecil has always been a most delicate boy. I hoped you were about to tell me that he was stronger, 
I replied. He is, and I will explain how in a moment. His life is a most important one, as Lord Carn much is expected of him. He has not only, under the providence of God, to live, but by that one little life he has to keep a man of exceedingly bad character out of a great property. I allude to Hugh Doncaster. Were Cecil to die, Hugh would be Lord Carn. You have already doubtless heard of his character? I know the man well by repute, I said. I thought you did. His disappointment and rage at Cecil succeeding to the title are almost beyond bounds. Rumors of his malevolent feelings toward the child have already reached me. I am told that he is now in London, but his life, like yours, is more or less mysterious. I thought it just possible, Norman, that you, as an old friend, might be able to get me some particulars with regard to his whereabouts. "'Why do you want to know?' I asked. "'I feel a strange uneasiness about him, something which I cannot account for. Of course, in these enlightened days he would not attempt the child's life, but I should be more comfortable if I were assured that he were nowhere in Cecil's vicinity.' "'But the man can do nothing to your boy,' I said. "'Of course, I will find out what I can, but—' Mrs. Kenyon interrupted me. "'Thank you. It is a relief to know that you will help me. Of course, there is no real danger, but I am a widow, and Cecil is only a child. Now I must tell you about his health. He is almost quite well. The most marvellous resurrection has taken place. For the last two months he has been under the care of that extraordinary woman, Madame Colucci. She has worked miracles in his case. And now, to complete the cure, she is sending him to the Mediterranean. He sails to-morrow night under the care of Dr. Fietta. I cannot bear parting with him, but it is for his good, and Madame Colucci insists that a sea voyage is indispensable. "'But won't you accompany him?' I asked. "'I am sorry to say that is impossible. My eldest girl, Ethel, is about to be married, and I cannot leave her on the eve of her wedding. But Cecil will be in good hands. Dr. Fietta is a capital fellow. I have every faith in him. "'Where are they going?' "'To Cairo. They sail to-morrow night in the Hedaspis.' "'Cairo is a fearfully hot place at this time of year. Are you quite sure it is wise to send a delicate lad like Cecil there in August?' "'Oh, he will not stay. He sails for the sake of the voyage, and will come back by the return boat. The voyage is, according to Madame Colucci, to complete the cure. That marvellous woman has succeeded where the medical profession gave little hope. You have heard of her, of course.' "'I am sick of her very name,' I replied. "'One hears it everywhere.' She has bewitched London with her impostures and quackery. There is no quackery about her, Norman. I believe her to be the cleverest woman in England. There are authentic accounts of her wonderful cures which cannot be contradicted. There are even rumours that she is able to restore youth and beauty by her arts. The whole of society is at her feet, and it is whispered that even royalty are among her patients. Of course, her fees are enormous, but look at the results. Have you ever met her? Never. Where does she come from? Who is she? She is an Italian, but she speaks English perfectly. She has taken a house which is a perfect palace in Welbeck Street. And who is Dr. Fietta? A medical man who assists Madame in her treatments. I have just seen him. He is charming and devoted to Cecil. Five o'clock? I had no idea it was so late. I must be going. You will let me know when you hear of any news of Mr. Doncaster? Come and see me soon." I accompanied my visitor to the door, and then, returning to my study, sat down to resume the work I had been engaged in when I was interrupted. But Mrs. Kenyon's visit had made me restless. I knew Hugh Doncaster's character well. Reports of his evil ways now and then agitated society, but the man had hitherto escaped the stern arm of justice. Of course, there could be no real foundation for Mrs. Kenyon's fears, but I felt that I could sympathize with her. The child was young and delicate, if Doncaster could injure him without discovery, he would not scruple to do so. As I thought over these things, a vague sensation of coming trouble possessed me. I hastily got into my evening dress, and having dined at my club, found myself at half-past ten in a drawing-room in Grosvenor Square. As I passed on into the reception rooms, having exchanged a few words with my hostess, I came across to Freyer, a lawyer and a special friend of mine. We got into conversation. As we talked, and my eyes glanced idly round the groups of smartly dressed people, I noticed where a crowd of men were clustering round and paying homage to a stately woman at the farther end of the room. A diamond star flashed in her dusky hair. On her neck and arms diamonds also glittered. She had an upright bearing and a regal appearance. Her rosy lips were smiling. The marked intelligence and power of her face could not fail to arrest attention, even in the most casual observer. At the first glance I felt that I had seen her before, 
but could not tell when or where. "'Who is that woman?' I asked of my companion. "'My dear fellow,' he replied with an amused smile, "'don't you know? That is the great Madame Colucci, the rage of the season, the great specialist, the great consultant. London is mad about her. She has only been here ten minutes, and look, she is going already. They say she has a dozen engagements every night.' Madame Colucci began to move towards the door, and, anxious to get a nearer view, I also passed rapidly through the throng. I reached the head of the stairs before she did, and as she went by looked her full in the face. Her eyes met mine. Their dark depths seemed to read me through. She half smiled, half paused as if to speak, changed her mind, made a stately inclination of her queenly head, and went slowly downstairs. For a moment I stood still. There was a ringing in my ears and my heart was beating to suffocation. Then I hastily followed her. When I reached the pavement, Madame Colucci's carriage stopped the way. She did not notice me, but I was able to observe her. She was bending out and talking eagerly to someone. The following words fell on my ear. "'It's all right. They sail to-morrow evening.' The man to whom she spoke made a reply which I could not catch, but I had seen his face. He was Hugh Doncaster. Madame Colucci's carriage rolled away, and I hailed a hansom. In supreme moments we think rapidly. I thought quickly then. "'Where to?' asked the driver. "'Number 140, Earl's Terrace, Kensington,' I called out. I sat back as I spoke. The horror of past memories was almost paralyzing me, but I quickly pulled myself together. I knew that I must act, and act quickly. I had just seen the head of the Brotherhood of the Seven Kings. Madame Colucci changed in much since I last saw her, was the woman who had wrecked my heart and life ten years ago in Naples. With my knowledge of the past I was well aware that where this woman appeared victims fell. Her present victim was a child. I must save that child, even if my own life were the penalty. She had ordered the boy abroad. He was to sail to-morrow with an emissary of hers. She was in league with Doncaster. If she could get rid of the boy, Doncaster would doubtless pay her a fabulous sum. For the working of her, she above all things wanted money. Yes, without a doubt, the lad's life was in the gravest danger, and I had not a moment to lose. The first thing was to communicate with the mother, and if possible, put a stop to the intended voyage. I arrived at the house, flung open the doors of the hansom, and ran up the steps. Here unexpected news awaited me. The servant who answered my summons said that Mrs. Kenyon had started for Scotland by the night mail. She had received a telegram announcing the serious illness of her eldest girl. On getting it she had started for the north, but would not reach her destination until the following evening. "'Is Lord Carne in?' I asked. "'No, sir,' was the reply. "'My mistress did not like to leave him here alone, and he has been sent over to Madame Colucci's, 100 Welbeck Street. Perhaps you are not aware, sir, that his lordship sails to-morrow evening for Cairo?' "'Yes, I know all about that,' I replied. "'And now, if you will give me your mistress's address, I shall be much obliged to you.' The man supplied it. I entered my hansom again. For a moment it occurred to me that I would send a telegram to intercept Mrs. Kenyon on her rapid journey north, but I finally made up my mind not to do so. The boy was already in the enemy's hands, and I felt sure that I could now only rescue him by guile. I returned home, having already made up my mind how to act. I would accompany Cecil and Dr. Fietta to Cairo. At eleven o'clock on the following morning I had taken my berth in the Hedaspis, and at nine that evening was on board. I caught a momentary glimpse of young Lord Carn and his attendant, but in order to avoid explanations kept out of their way. It was not until the following morning, when the steamer was well down the channel, that I made my appearance on deck, where I at once saw the boy sitting at the stern in a chair. Beside him was a lean, middle-aged man wearing a pair of pince-nez. He looked every inch a foreigner, with his pointed beard, waxed moustache, and deep-set beady eyes. As I sauntered across the deck to where they were sitting, Lord Carne looked up and instantly recognized me. "'Mr. Head!' he exclaimed, jumping up from his chair. "'You here? I am very glad to see you.' "'I am on my way to Cairo, on business,' I said, shaking the boy warmly by the hand. "'To Cairo? Why, that is where we are going. But you never told Mother you were coming, and she saw you the day before yesterday.' It was such a pity that Mother had to rush off to Scotland so suddenly. But last night, just before we sailed, there came a telegram, telling us that Ethel was better. As Mother had to go away, I went to Madame Colucci's for the night. I love going there, 
She has a lovely house, and she is so delightful herself. And this is Dr. Fietta, who has come with me. As the boy added these words, Dr. Fietta came forward and peered at me through his pince-nez. I bowed, and he returned my salutation. "'This is an extraordinary coincidence, Dr. Fietta,' I exclaimed. "'Cecil Kenyon happens to be the son of one of my greatest friends. I am glad to see him looking so well. Whatever Madame Colucci's treatment has been, it has had a marvellous effect. I am told that you are fortunate enough to be the participator in her wonderful secrets and cures.' "'I have the honour of assisting Madame Colucci, he replied with a strong foreign accent. "'But may I take the liberty of inquiring who gave you the information about myself?' "'It was Mrs. Kenyon,' I answered. "'She told me all about you the other day.' "'She knew, then, that you were going to be a fellow-passenger of her son's?' "'No, for I did not know myself. An urgent telegram calling me to Egypt arrived that evening, and I only booked my passage yesterday.' I am fortunate in having the honour of meeting so distinguished a savant as yourself. I have heard much about Madame Colucci's marvellous occult powers, but I suppose the secrets of her success are very jealously guarded. The profession, of course, pooh-pooh her, I know, but if one may credit all one hears, she possesses remedies undreamt of in their philosophy. It is quite true, Mr. Head. As a medical man myself, I can vouch for her capacity, and unfettered by English professional scrupulousness— Madame Colucci and I are very proud of our young friend here, and hope that the voyage will complete his cure, and will fit him for the high position he is destined to occupy. The voyage flew by. Fietta was an intelligent man, and his scientific attainments were considerable. But for my knowledge of the terrible past, my fears might have slumbered. But as it was, they were always present with me, and the moment all too quickly arrived when suspicion was to be plunged into certainty. On the day before we were due at Malta, the wind sprang up, and we got into a choppy sea. When I had finished breakfast, I went to Cecil's cabin to see how he was. He was just getting up, and looked pale and unwell. "'There is a nasty sea on,' I said, "'but the captain says we shall be out of it in an hour or so.' "'I hope we shall,' he answered, "'for it makes me feel squeamish, but I dare say I shall be all right when I get on deck. Dr. Fietta has given me something to stop the sickness.' but it has not had much effect. "'I do not know anything that really stops seasickness,' I answered. "'But what has he done?' "'Oh, a curious thing, Mr. Head. He pricked my arm with a needle on a syringe and squirted something in. He says it is a certain cure for seasickness. Look,' said the child, bearing his arm, "'that is where he did it.' I examined the mark closely. It had evidently been made with a hypodermic injection needle. "'Did Dr. Fietta tell you what he put into your arm?' I asked. "'Yes,' He said it was morphia. Where does he keep his needle? It is on his trunk, there, under his bunk. I shall be dressed directly, and will come on deck. I left the cabin and went up the companion. The doctor was pacing to and fro on the hurricane deck. I approached him. Your charge has not been well, I said. I have just seen him. He tells me you have given him a hypodermic of morphia. He turned round and gave me a quick glance of uneasy fear. Did Lord Carn tell you so? Yes. "'Well, Mr. Head, it is the very best cure for seasickness. I have found it very efficacious.' "'Do you think it wise to give a child morphia?' I asked. "'I do not discuss my treatment with an unqualified man,' he replied brusquely, turning away as he spoke. I looked after him, and as he disappeared down the deck my fears became certainties. I determined, come what would, to find out what he had given the boy.' I knew only too well the infinite possibilities of that dangerous little instrument, a hypodermic syringe. As the day wore on, the sea moderated, and at five o'clock it was quite calm again, a welcome change to the passengers, who, with the permission of the captain, had arranged to give a dance that evening on deck. The occasion was one when ordinary scruples must fade out of sight. Honour in such a mission as I had set myself must take place to the watchful zeal of the detective." I was determined to take advantage of the dance to explore Dr. Fietta's cabin. The doctor was fond of dancing, and as soon as I saw that he and Lord Carne were well engaged, I descended the companion and went to their cabin. I switched on the electric light, and dragging the trunk from beneath the bunk, hastily opened it. It was unlocked, and only secured by straps. I ran my hand rapidly through the contents, which were chiefly clothes, but tucked in one corner I found a case, and pulling it out opened it, Inside lay the delicate little hypodermic syringe, which I had come in search of. 
I hurried up to the light and examined it. Smeared round the inside of the glass and adhering to the bottom of the little plunger was a whitish, gelatinous-looking substance. This was no ordinary hypodermic solution. It was half-liquefied gelatin, such as I knew so well as the medium for the cultivation of microorganisms. For a moment I felt half-stunned. What infernal culture might it not contain? Time was flying, and at any moment I might be discovered. I hastily slipped the syringe into my pocket, and closing the trunk replaced it, and switching off the electric light returned to the deck. My temples were throbbing, and it was with difficulty I could keep my self-control. I made up my mind quickly. Fietta would, of course, miss the syringe, but the chances were that he would not do so that night. As yet there was nothing apparently the matter with the boy, but might there not be flowing through his veins some poisonous germs of disease, which only required a period of incubation for their development? At daybreak the boat would arrive at Malta. I would go on shore at once, call upon some medical man, and lay the case before him in confidence, in the hope of his having the things I should need in order to examine the contents of the syringe. If I found any organisms, I would take the law into my own hands, and carry the boy back to England by the next boat. No sleep visited me that night, and I lay tossing to and fro in my bunk, longing for daylight. At six a.m. I heard the engine bell ring, and the screw suddenly slow down to half speed. I leapt up and went on deck. I could see the outline of the rock-bound fortress and the lighthouse of St. Elmo looming more vividly every moment. As soon as we were at anchor and the gangway down, I hailed one of the little green boats, and told the men to row me to the shore. I drove at once to the Grand Hotel in the Strada Real, and asked the Italian guide the address of a medical man. He gave me the address of an English doctor who lived close by, and I went there at once to see him. It was now seven o'clock, and I found him up. I made my apologies for the early hour of my visit, put the whole matter before him, and produced the syringe. For a moment he was inclined to take my story with incredulity, but by degrees he became interested, and ended by inviting me to breakfast with him. After the meal we repaired to his consulting-room to make our investigations. He brought out his microscope, which I saw, to my delight, was of the latest design, and I set at once to work, while he watched me with evident interest. At last the crucial moment came, and I bent over the instrument and adjusted the focus on my preparation. My suspicions were only too well confirmed by what I had extracted, which I saw. The substance from the syringe was a mass of microorganisms, but of what nature I did not know. I had never seen anything quite like them before. I drew back. "'I wish you would look at this,' I said. "'You tell me you have devoted considerable attention to bacteriology. Please tell me what you see.' Dr. Benson applied his eye to the instrument, regulating the focus for a few moments in silence. Then he raised his head and looked at me with a curious expression. "'Where did this culture come from?' he asked. "'From London, I presume,' I answered. "'It is extraordinary,' he said with emphasis, "'but there is no doubt, whatever, that these organisms are the specific germs of the very disease I have studied here so assiduously. They are the micrococci of Mediterranean fever, the minute round or oval bacteria. They are absolutely characteristic.' I jumped to my feet. "'Is that so?' I cried. The diabolical nature of the plot was only too plain. These germs injected into a patient would produce a fever which only occurs in the Mediterranean. The fact that the boy had been in the Mediterranean even for a short time would be a complete blind as to the way in which they obtained access to the body, as every one would think the disease occurred from natural causes. "'How long is the period of incubation?' I asked. "'About ten days,' replied Dr. Benson. I extended my hand. "'You have done me an invaluable service,' I said." "'I may possibly be able to do you a still further service,' was his reply. "'I have made Mediterranean fever the study of my life, and have, I believe, discovered an antitoxin for it. I have tried my discovery on the patients of the Naval Hospital with excellent results. The local disturbance is slight, and I have never found bad symptoms follow the treatment. If you will bring the boy to me, I will administer the antidote without delay.' I considered for a moment, then I said, my position is a terrible one, and I am inclined to accept your proposition. Under the circumstances, it is the only chance. It is, replied Dr. Benson. I shall be at your service whenever you need me. I bade him good-bye, and quickly left the house. End of Part 1 of Chapter 1